we have everyone from PEPCO on the line and the recording has started. So we are ready to begin whenever you are. Okay, I will be ready momentarily. Okay. Good afternoon. For the record, today is August 10th, 2022. The time is 2 p.m. This is a meeting of the Public Service Commission of the District of Columbia being held via conference call. I am Emil C. Thompson, Chairman of the Public Service Commission. Also participating via conference call is Commissioner Richard Beverly. Pursuant to the Open Meeting Act, the Commission scheduled this meeting to consider formal case matters that require Commission action. The proposed agenda for this meeting was posted on Monday, August 8, 2022. A record of today's open meeting will be available on the Commission's website after the meeting concludes. Commissioner Beverly, are you prepared to vote and adopt the agenda? Yes. All in favor of adopting the agenda, please indicate by stating yes. Yes. And I vote yes. The agenda is adopted. Today, there are three action items before the Commission. The matters are 1. Formal case number 1156 in the matter of the application. Potomac Electric Power Company for authority to implement a multi year rate plan for electric distribution service in the District of Columbia. This order, among other things, accepts the second performance incentive mechanism working group report. The Commission directs PEPCO to compile and publish actual performance data for both calendar years 2020 and 2021 for four performance tracking metrics, PTM, on a dashboard style website. The Commission reconvenes the PIMS working group to make recommendations for annual performance targets for the next five years. In addition, the Commission directs the PIMS working group to make recommendations on the future conversion of four PTMs into fully functional PIMS. Number two, formal case number 1160, in the matter of the development of the metrics for electric. <coughs> Company and gas company energy efficiency and demand and response programs pursuant to section 201B of the Clean Energy DC on the Bus Amendment Act of 2018. This order grants in part PEPCO's application to approve three year energy efficiency and demand response program. The Commission approves a modified set of programs, including the following as set forth in PEPCO's application 1. Efficient products program. 2. Quick Home Energy Checkup Program, three, Residential Behavior Based Program, four, LMI Home Energy Program, five, Commercial Behavior Based Program, six, Midstream Program, seven, Existing Buildings Program, and eight, Low and Moderate Income Community Pilots. The Commission also approves a small business program, but modified, modifies the approved program costs. PEPCO to implement the approved modified energy efficiency and demand response programs beginning on January 1, 2023 and continuing for three years after and may recover approved program costs through Rider EER. And number three, formal case number 1169 in the matter of the application of Washington Gaslight Company authority to increase existing rates and charges for gas service. This order denies AOBA's Motion requested that the Commission either reject or hold in abeyance the rate increase application of WGL and grants AOBA's <coughs> supplemental testimony motion regarding affiliate services to WGL. The Commission also directs WGL to file supplemental testimony on the IRS private letter ruling. The Commission also grants in part and denies in part OPC's motion for partial summary judgment and related relief, the Sierra Club's motion to hold in abeyance. And the motion of OPC to reject WGL's request for condensed procedural schedule. The commission does not designate specific issues for this proceeding and defers identification of issues of material fact and dispute until after all testimony has been filed. The commission declines to adopt, sorry, to appoint a settlement officer in this proceeding. And finally, the commission adopts a revised procedural schedule. All in favor of approving the recommended orders, please indicate by stating yes. Yes, and I vote yes. The orders are approved. The next regular open meeting will be held on September 14th, 2022 at 2 p.m. via conference call. The proposed agenda for the meeting will be posted at least 48 hours before the announced meeting. 
The commission will now hear from Pepco on the state of the company. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson, and hello, I'm sorry, Chairman Thompson and Commissioner Beverly. Thank you for your time today. Um, as you noted, this we are here to discuss Pepco's state of the company, which essentially provides results from the year 2021. And also, we're very excited to share our plans and strategy and vision for the newly separated Exelon, which is the Pure Play T and D Corporation. I will introduce the panelists. Many are familiar faces, maybe not in the state of the company presentation, but I know that you have met all of the individuals on this team and worked with them in various ways. Uh, first, Calvin Butler, Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Exelon. Second, Tyler Anthony, President and CEO, Pepco Holdings. Third, Rodney Adoy, Senior Vice President, Government Regulatory and External Affairs for Pepco Holdings. And then finally, Donna Cooper, President of the Pepco Region. I will turn it over to Calvin to start the presentation. Thank you again. Morgan, thank you. And, and let me just take a few moments to say thank you to uh, Chairman Thompson and Commissioner uh, Beverly for inviting us to join you today. I'm pleased to be with you virtually uh, to share the tremendous benefits that Exelon is bringing to customers and communities within Washington, D.C. As, as this is my third time appearing before the commission, I, I miss being with you in the chambers uh, in person, but we've done this, we've kind of got old hat of doing this virtually now, so it, it is good to spend this time. I know Morgan introduced Tyler as the president and CEO of PHI, but I want to provide a little backdrop about Tyler. This is his first time in presenting the state of the company piece. Tyler, for the last six years prior to his appointment as CEO and president, served as chief operating officer for PHI. And I say that because Tyler was responsible for really partnering with David Velasquez in his role as CEO and leading the operational excellence that I, I think the District of Columbia has begun to enjoy as Pepco Holdings and Pepco has really leaned into making Pepco one of the premier utilities in the nation. And you'll hear from Tyler later in the team, but I just wanted to recognize all his efforts as COO and his elevation as president and CEO. Well, as you know, since we last met, and we're going to the first slide, please, Exelon has now separated from Constellation, the retail and power generation side of our business. Next slide. It's been six months, and we are firmly on a journey to strategically position the new standalone Exelon as the premier energy delivery company in the nation. This slide before you shows that some of the nuts and bolts of who we are today each individual utility and Exelon as a whole. But I wanna share with you what we're going to be tomorrow. We're focused on growing our six high-performing energy companies and that's what makes Exelon's future so exciting. I think about our purpose, powering a cleaner and brighter future for our customers and communities. And I'm excited about the opportunity to redefine what it means for us and for all of our customers in each of our jurisdictions, including right here in the district. When we last met, we were a combined organization having to balance many different interests. And I think we did a good job of it. Now, however, as a pure transmission and distribution company, we can more sharply focus our service to our customers when it comes to innovation, impact, equity, and clean energy solutions all things that I know are important to this commission. We are able now to take our purpose to the next level. And that's what really excites me. Next slide, please. So how do we do it? How do we work toward our mission now? And how will we strengthen that in the future? Today, as the only pure TND company of our size and scale, we help power the economic health and well-being of the diverse and densely populated communities we serve while advocating for equity. We continuously strive for best-in-class operations. Given our industry-leading platform and proven model of operational excellence, customer satisfaction, and constructive, I hope you believe this, regulatory relationships, we believe Exelon is best positioned to lead the nation 
and more importantly, our customers on a path to clean energy, on a path to a clean energy future, starting with our own path to clean. A bold goal that we set to get Exelon to net zero operations driven emissions by 2050. We are growing our business by supporting new technologies, electrification, and grid modernization. The fact that we serve such densely populated areas as DC and the surrounding areas, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Baltimore is a key differentiator for us relative to our peers. It means that there's a large base of customers relying on us and interested in ensuring that our investment modernizes infrastructure and addresses climate change. It also means that our, found, our platform is a foundation for economic growth and opportunity in areas that need it most. Our investments create jobs and new business opportunities while maintaining affordability. I'll talk about those jobs and new business opportunities on a later slide. Beyond our core operations, we know that our company's financial health and a focus on ESG excellence can't be separated. The utility business demands a focus on environmental and social issues. If the people in DC's communities aren't breathing clean air, if they can't get good paying jobs because they don't have the training, if we can't connect them because we don't reflect the same diversity of experience and thinking, our ability to lead has been significantly reduced. Exelon has stood for these principles for a long time. We were doing ESG before there was an acronym for it. And we're going to keep being serious about ESG. That hasn't changed post-separation, and it won't change in the future. Next slide. As you know, our customers are demanding a cleaner, more resilient grid. DC is demanding it as well. And like other state and local officials and jurisdictions we serve, the District of Columbia has set clean energy commitments that extend to 2015, 2050, and beyond. We're grateful for the district's leadership in this, and we're proud to partner to meet these goals. I also want to say thank you to the commission for its leadership in creating an IIJA docket. The IIJA has great potential to help the district meet its clean energy commitments in years to come. We look forward to partnership with the commission in maximizing the IIJA funding. There's a tremendous amount of work required to transform the energy ecosystem. I want you to know, Exelon will lead the energy transformation. The transportation sector, for example, currently represent about a, represents about a third of total US greenhouse gas emissions. Urban areas like DC, and many of our other service areas are disproportionately affected by air pollution and the negative effects of climate change. I know I'm preaching to the choir, and I also know that I say that policymaking has to address equity, and I know this commission believes that. And I want to assure you that we advocate for it. We are advocating for and helping to usher in cleaner, zero emission transportation, particularly in underserved and under-resourced communities. One statistic that sticks in my head is this. Bloomberg New Energy Finance estimates that there will be nearly 28 million EVs on ro US roads in 2030, a 32% annual growth rate from where we are today. Now that's not long from now. And so the need for infrastructure investment to support electrifying trans the transportation sector is indisputable. With our structural advan advantages and industry leading platform, we think it's clear that Exelon is the premier T&D operator and we will lead the industry to a cleaner, more resilient grid. We could not be more excited to be in this position. The last slide, please. Undergirding all of this work is our strong desire for and commitment to true impact. We're partnering with communities to eliminate barriers to economic empowerment, 
through workforce development and by fostering lifelong energy careers. And we're advocating for equitable access to clean energy opportunities, ensuring all customers benefit, not just those who live in certain zip codes. I'm very proud in particular of our workforce development efforts. When we talk about being a good corporate citizen, this is one of the most exciting and tangible ways that I can point you to, to showing how we're doing exactly that. I know Pepco Regional President Donna Cooper will talk with you in a bit about our workforce development focus in the district. So I won't go into that lot of detail here, except to say that workforce development is foundational to our operational excellence. Our strategy is to address economic inequities in underserved and under-resourced communities where Exelon operates and it's showing results already. Just recently, we were selected by the Center for Earth for Energy Workforce Development for its highest honor, the 2021 Chairman's Award, recognizing Exelon for our excellence in workforce development leadership. In 2021, we invested over $14 million in support of our more than 77 different workforce development programs across our six utilities. These programs reached more than 5,000 participants and more than 349% Infrastructure Academy graduates were offered jobs internally or with other companies. I'm also proud of our work with historically black colleges and universities. Chairman Thompson, I know the Morehouse man in you will appreciate this work as well. And I bet your daughter will love to over there at the Mecca. But we announced this year our $3 million HBCU corporate scholars program funded by us and the Exelon Foundation. This program includes $2.4 million in scholarships, internships, experiences, and early career readiness training for 24 freshmen attending historically black colleges and universities. Each student will receive $25,000 of need-based aid per, per year for four years, a total of up to $100,000. The program will help prepare HBCU students for rewarding careers here at Exelon and elsewhere in the energy industry. Bottom line is that we're serious about building the energy workforce of the future but we're going to do it and are doing it equitably. And I can't miss an opportunity to speak to you today about our Racial Equity Capital Fund. In partnership with the Exelon Foundation, we have launched a $36 million investment fund to expand access to capital for minority businesses so they can create more jobs, grow their companies, and reinvest in their neighborhoods and communities. We're investing in numerous businesses throughout our service areas over the next three years with estimated loan amounts between $100,000 and $300,000 and equity investments of nearly $1 million. See, the idea of the fund was born from a conversation right here between PEPCO and the Washington Interface Network, or WIN, on how we could continue to promote racial equity. PEPCO initially partnered with WIN to help recruit trainees from our DC Infrastructure Academy, one of our workforce development job training programs. But to grow and scale the idea, we tapped into the expertise of a fund manager based here in DC, Rock Creek. Rock Creek is a woman owned firm with more than 75% diverse ownership and management team diversity. With Rock Creek's help under the leadership of CEO, Afsane Beschloss, business right here in the District of Columbia, have been applying. I'm pleased to share that Rock Creek will soon be announcing who the first round of recipients will be. It's important to note here that the money for the fund is coming from shareholder dollars and will not be recovered in rates. We launched this fund because we believe we have a responsibility to make our community stronger and more resilient. It's also important to know that the idea originated, as I said, at PEPCO, but we took that across our, enti our entire platform. And that's what we call the power of the platform. That's because ideas generate everywhere. And by us leaning in with one another, we know we have a deeper impact on the communities than we could have just by ourselves. 
We're honored to be able to invest in this way for lasting, transformative impact. As I wrap up my time with you, let me reiterate, we are committed to helping the district and the commission accomplish its objectives. DC customers benefit from the collective strength and capabilities of the 18,000 men and women across our six energy companies. I wanna thank you for allowing us to serve the people of the District of Columbia in such comprehensive and diverse ways. I'll now hand it over to the Pepco Holdings President and CEO, Tyler Anthony. Tyler. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, wanted to also thank uh, Chairman Thompson, Commissioner Beverly for the opportunity to present to everybody today. And Calvin, thank you for that summary, as well as your, your kind comments uh, about myself taking over the role. You know, as I reflect um, a little bit of background uh, for, for your benefit is I, I came here a little over six years ago as a function of the merger where I had spent 15 years in Chicago running the city of Chicago and Northern Illinois electric system as the head of operations. And I must say that it's been an honor to serve and how serious I take the opportunity and the importance of the electric grid here in the district. Um, as I transition into my new role, I've had the benefit of Dave Velasquez has been my mentor for the last six years. And I look forward to an ongoing relationship with him as he has now assumed a, a senior executive role running all operational divisions of Exelon working for Calvin. Um, as I took the role in November, what I wanted to cover here on the first slide is I think we can all appreciate that we're, we're only as strong as the individuals that we pick and surround ourselves with. And what this slide reflects is it reflects um, the new leadership team here at Pepco Holdings. Um, what you have here is four of the individuals are in new roles, and I'm just going to hit uh, starting with my replacement, Tamla Olivier, as you work from the left on the screen. Uh, Tamla comes to us. She's a 12-year a employee for Exelon. She most recently held positions as chief customer officer at BG&E, as well as she was the CEO of BG&E Home. So I'm, I'm grateful that Tamla has joined the team in my previous role as chief operating officer, and she is now responsible for all implementation of all improvements, as well as daily operations of the system. And you move over Phil, Phil Barnett. He is our chief financial officer. Phil has been enrolled since 2018. Moving uh, again to the right, uh, Moreland Belazard. She's been uh, recently promoted. She was the vice president of customer operations for Pepco Holding. And now she moves up to assume the role of senior vice president and chief customer officer. And then last, uh, I'll call him a first round draft pick here. I was able to secure Rodney O'Doy as our senior vice president of governmental, regulatory, and external affairs. Basically, Rodney's responsible for everything external, which includes all of our commission work and all of our legislative work, both at the state and local level. Rodney, uh, as well, has a unique background for his current role. He has extensive experience coming out of BG and operations, as well as he has extensive governmental and regulatory affairs experience having held this role at Baltimore Gas and Electric as well. So I'd just like to share and um, introduce the, the commission uh, to the new team here at Pepco Holdings, and we're looking forward to the challenges ahead. If you go to the next slide, you know, after setting the team, you know, I felt like it was important as the new president and CEO to set what is the vision and the priorities for Pepco Holdings as we go out into the next 12, 24, 36 months. And the team and I, we've come up with a framework of what we call our strategy house. And there's four pillars in that strategy house I just wanna cover with the commission. And basically this is, this is who we are and what our focus areas are as a company. Starting from the left, I think Calvin covered it nicely about how this, um, how this kind of takes from the Exelon corporate goals and strategies where Enabling climate solutions to climate change is of critical importance to us. You know, it's no, no, you know, the district has taken a national leading role, role model as far as carbon reductions. And we want to be a partner in that. And we want to be 
I'll say the go to to help the district make those make those goals that have been set. You know, whether it's the um, onset of EVs, whether it's the clean forms of energy. One one interesting data point that I had heard the other day is that if you took Pepco Holdings and made us a state, our three operating companies, we would now be the 10th largest state for solar penetration in the country with well over a, well over 100,000 installed um, residential homes with um, rooftop solar in our three operating districts. We're very proud of that. So when you think about where we're at with the most recent, you know, weather changes due to climate control, et cetera, this is clearly one of the main tenants of where we're focused and where we want to become a trusted partner. And moving over, you know, enhancing the grid performance. In my six years as COO, you know, we've had a lot of great, um, a lot of great relationships as what we've tried to do to make sure that the grid is ready, not only for the current challenges of climate change, but ready for the onset of electrification. And I'm also pleased to say we're well on our way. You know, we have uh, what I'll call national landmark projects going on together with the capital grid for uh, sustaining the transmission system in a networked in a networked approach as we move forward, as well as our DC plug that we worked closely with to underground 40 of our overhead circuits um, based on their, their performance trends and how we could once again, harden the system and have it ready to accept the challenges ahead. Moving over to the third area, you know, I'll talk about uh, social equity. I also think Calvin gave a nice summary there. But what, I, what I'll say about our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion is this. As far as Pepco Holdings, this establishes our sense of purpose and belonging. This is who we are, and this is where our strength lies. You know, how we do it and who we do it with is every bit as important as what we do. And we also hold the fact of our influence and our ability to impact the community we serve as once again an honor and almost an expectation of the way we should operate. And then last, you know, delivering that superior customer experience. What I'll say about this area, pretty straightforward is, there's no decision that myself or my staff will make that doesn't ask two fundamental questions. One, how does this decision improve customer benefits? And two, what is the affordability of this decision that we're making? So uh, as far as the team, we're all we're kind of in position and set. And as far as our strategy, these are our four pillars and focus areas. Okay, next slide. You know, and as I, I bring my slides to an end, I also thought it would be beneficial to talk a little bit about the journey that we've been on together. And what this is, uh, this slide represents, it's an excerpt from our different external um, communication we do around performance of the company, whether it be earnings, calls, et cetera, or internal meetings. But I thought I would share excerpts from uh, 2015, 2018, and most recently year ending 2021. And what you have on the on the left side of the chart is these are some of our key indicators. You know, I'll take one very straightforward. It's about reliability, and I'm I'm all I'm very pleased to to report to the commission that since 2016, as compared to 2020, 2021, we have had a 45 percent improvement in the District of Columbia's reliability and safety performance. 45 percent, and and I could go you know on on some of the other ones, but you can kind of just get a general sense whether it's our customer sat, whether it's how we respond to outages. You know, here we are again today, another strong weather report in the, uh, in the forecast where we're trying to be ready for those events, respond as expected, and make sure that we have the sensitivity um, for, for the events that are, are about to occur. But I'm proud to show, show you this, this chart, if you will, about the journey we've been on together. And as I think of the merger, with Exelon at the commission approved back in 2016. I hope that the, you know, the commission, commission staff and others look at it as a benefit for having that, have made that decision with us. And when you look at the, um, all of the different commitments that we made, whether it's through workforce, whether it's through our performance, um, I think you'll find that in all cases, we have met those commitments as we laid out back in 2016. And on behalf of the men and women in the company, I'm very proud of what they've done. 
okay? And if we go to the next slide, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn it over to Rodney and he's gonna talk a little bit about some of the external pieces. He's gonna start here with the power of relationships. So with that, Rodney, why don't you take it from here? No, good afternoon. And thank you, Tyler and Calvin uh, for your remarks. And I also wanna thank uh, Chairman Thompson and Commissioner Beverly uh, for your continued engagement. As I noted uh, earlier this year during my meet and greets, we are very uh, excited about the opportunity to really continue to dip deepen our partnerships uh, with the District of Columbia. I will spend the majority of my time really introducing our newly formed PHI, uh, Government Regulatory and External Affairs Organization. You heard Tyler mention the integration of all our external facing uh, functions and really the benefits we see uh, through the power of relationships for the customers and communities we serve. Uh, we really continue to advance clean energy opportunities like solar, energy storage, and other distributed energy resources to really drive innovation and help combat climate change, as you heard Tyler mention. And we hope this will lead to improved economic and social equity in our communities. We certainly recognize uh, the role PEPCO Holdings plays uh, in really ensuring appropriate and positive social determinants within the communities. We are building uh, a new corporate community impact organization, and this will is something we haven't done before here at Pepco Holdings. This new team will oversee our organization's existing corporate relations uh, efforts with a focus on enhancing the company's uh, impact really on our under-resourced communities. Uh, this organization will also expand our community engagement efforts uh, with our anchor institutions, such as our schools. I'm also very uh, excited to announce that we will be standing up a newly formed economic development organization that will work with the various jurisdictions, economic development agencies to really ensure that the priorities that we have are in alignment with the jurisdictions. And then finally, uh, Calvin mentioned this a little bit about our engagement in the workforce development arena, and I'll touch on that really briefly. Uh, I am very excited about the work we are doing to expand our partnerships with our historically black colleges and universities through Excellence Racial Equity Initiative. Uh, and we're making that, uh, we're bringing that really home uh, within all the PHI family of companies. If we could go to slide 11, uh, appreciate it. Uh, with regards to the power of partnerships, our commitment uh, to volunteerism continues to increase. In 2021, we had well across the PHI family of companies, we had well over 300 employees volunteer a combined total of more than 1,200 workdays uh, throughout the program, really helping uh, to support approximately 200 different events. This past April, Tyler and I had the unique opportunity to really participate in a volunteer event at the ARC uh, Farm on Mississippi Avenue in Southeast DC. As most of you uh, will know, hopefully, the farm is one of the core programs for the building bridges across the river, which really provides residents east of the Anacostia River, uh, access to best-in-class facilities, programs, and partnerships in arts and culture, as well as economic opportunity, education, recreation, and health and well-being. We had well over two dozen Pepco Holdings volunteers working in their garden, and, and these are just some pictures from that, from that event. Uh, I'm also uh, very excited about our partnerships with the HBCUs directly. We supported uh, both Howard University and the University of the District of Columbia uh, with resources over $300,000 specifically for the Ronald uh, W. Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center, uh, as well as internships uh, in engineering and, and architecture. And then uh, specifically for the University of the District of Columbia, really developing America's workforce nucleus or DAWN as they call it, uh, energy program. Uh, Tyler and I recently had an opportunity to um, have an engagement uh, with Dr. Ronald Mason at, at UDC. And as a result of that engagement, we're expanding that partnership and working on a plan to, uh, to create new roles within our operations control center. This process is still in, in, in its infancy, but we work, uh, we hope to really work through the specifics of that. And the next time we meet, uh, provide an update on that. Calvin mentioned Excellence uh, partnership uh, through the UNCF uh, with our HBCUs and the 24 students. I'm also very excited to uh, note that uh, six 
of the, those students are Howard University students, as well as two from UDC. And so we really see a role uh, that we play in the communities we serve, directly impacting uh, and, and changing lives through that process. We have much more planned uh, for 2022 and the coming years beyond. The HBCU initiatives are just one dimension. Uh, as I mentioned, our corporate relations and our economic development will be key uh, for our success moving forward. And so I'm excited uh, to work with Donna and the entire uh, PEPCO uh, team as we advance these priorities uh, for the company. And with that, I'll turn it over to our regional president, uh, Donna Cooper, to get into some specifics regarding the uh, District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodney. Thank you, Calvin, and thank you, Tyler. I wanted to start by recognizing Chairman Thompson, as well as Commissioner Beverly, and the staff of the Public Service Commission of the District of Columbia. I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to provide updates on PEPCO's performance in 2021. I would like to go to that first slide, and I wanted to note uh, that the title of my first slide, from my perspective, captures a major milestone for PEPCO and our customers. In 2021, we recognize 125 years of service, currently serving 312,000 customers in the District of Columbia. When I reflect on the district, the diversity of our communities is one of our most valuable assets. And as was stated earlier, we must ensure that we're serving everyone equitably as well as inclusively. And this relates directly to our company and the diversity of our team. We strive to ensure that we are representative of the communities that we serve. Based on 2021 data, PEPCO's District of Columbia workforce is 71% diverse, with 67% of all new hires being of diverse backgrounds and 65% of promotions. We all know that diversity drives better decision-making and awareness, resulting in better outcomes for all. In 2021, we're pleased to report that we continued our progress in delivering reliable service to our customers with a 96% customer satisfaction rating. While we recognize this as a major accomplishment, we are acutely aware that our work to enhance and maintain our system must continue. Turning now to solar interconnection, in 2021, in partnership with the District of Columbia government, the DCSEU, solar developers, and our customers, we connected 11,280.12 kilowatts of community renewable energy facilities in the District of Columbia. That is a major milestone as well. This represented 117 new facilities. Last but not least, we continue to take deliberate and intentional actions to increase our spend with diverse contractors. In 2021, our spend with diverse suppliers represented 42% of our total spend. We recently testified before the Public Service Commission at your inaugural hearing on minority supplier diversity. I want to thank you personally for your commitment to advancing growth and sustainability for local and diverse businesses. Again, while this is a major milestone, we do recognize that there are additional opportunities and we're com committed to increasing the spend as well as focusing on programs, initiatives, access to capital in order to strengthen our local and diverse business partners. Next slide, please. It has been captured earlier that one of our most critical issues of our time is definitely climate change. We unfortunately do not have an extensive horizon to get this right. And the District of Columbia government and the commission have advanced goals as well as directives that truly capture this urgency. PEPCO is committed to being a partner in helping the district to achieve its landmark goals. Next slide, please. PEPCO released its climate change commitment in late 2020 which commits our company to achieving a 70% reduction in our operational greenhouse gas footprint by 2025. Building on this plan, we filed with the commission our climate solutions five-year action plan and 30-year transition plan, which builds on the foundation of these initial programs and advances the district's roadmap to carbon neutrality by 2050. 
The implementation of key technologies and programs such as energy efficiency programs, the implementation of transportation electrification programs, and connecting more clean energy to a modernized grid will all contribute in very meaningful ways to really reducing our carbon footprint and reaching the goals of the District of Columbia. The district has a 100% RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard by 2032, and again, striving to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Turning now to reliability and resiliency, and Tyler highlighted this earlier. PEPCO achieved top decile performance again in 2021, with our customers experiencing the second lowest frequency of electric outages just shy of the record set in 2020. Even when service was interrupted, crews were able to safely restore service in 116 minutes on average. Earlier, Calvin spoke to the issue of affordability. When we discuss clean energy priorities, our roadmap for getting there, investments around resiliency, as well as reliability and modernization, I would be remiss if we did not talk about how do we address affordability within that equation. The pandemic has exacerbated economic challenges for many. It takes intentional, deliberate programs and initiatives to provide that relief to our customers. We are pleased to have worked very closely with the District Department of Energy and the Environment, OPC, the district government through the mayor's office, and other key partners in connecting our customers to the state DC assistance. I want to recognize the commission approving several affordability programs through the multi-year plan that focused on enhancements for our residential customers, nonprofit organizations, small businesses, as well as houses of worship. We must continue to ensure that we're working in partnership to make certain that our customers are aware of the residential aid discount program, the arrearage management program, and most importantly, outside of programs, we're committed as a company to working with our customers on individual payment arrangements so that we can meet customers where they are. As a new green economy is created and we continue to make our grid stronger and smarter, we have a significant opportunity to train that workforce for the future. I wanted to highlight the DC Infrastructure Academy, uh, recognizing Mayor Bowser. We have been partnering with Mayor Bowser on the Infrastructure Academy since its inception. Since the ribbon cutting in 2018, 163 students have graduated and we're targeting this year over 100 graduates in 2022 with every graduate receiving a job offer. Next slide, please. In closing, I would like to briefly highlight our performance in the areas of reliability and safety. In 2021, our system average interruption frequency index was 0.45 with a target of 0.58. The system average interruption duration index was 52 and the target was 69. One of the things that I want to highlight is the progress since 2016. SAFE was at 0.85 and SADI was 115. Finally, turning to safety. In 2021, we closed the year with 0.82 OSHA recordables and 0.56 our 25 cases of days away restricted or transferred. We are in the first quartile for OSHA recordables and second quartile for DART. We have continued to improve as well year over year since 2016. Thank you for the opportunity to report on our performance for 2021 in service to the District of Columbia and our valued customers. At this time, I would like to turn it back over to Tyler Anthony, our president and CEO for closing comments. Thank yeah. you. Uh, very good, Donna covered some great stuff. Rodney, thank you as well. You know, I'll just be brief here and we can open up for questions. Um, I just wanted to close with, as the, as the new CEO here, uh, I just wanted to give my commitment that our organization will be transparent. We're gonna be very self-critical. We will acknowledge when we fall short of expectations and we're always gonna strive to be more efficient. 
I believe that the challenges facing us are kind of exciting and somewhat uh, overwhelming when you think of the electrification of the of the uh, of the and the demands that are going to be put on the grid. And I think with a foundation of trust and a foundation of working together, I frankly don't think there's nothing we can't accomplish together. So thank you for your time today. And thank each of you for appearing um, here today. You know, I know this is part of a merger commitment, but I find this uh, state of the company to be very, very informative in terms of laying out the roadmap for the next year. I want to give a few comments on each of the presentations, and then I will um, give a chance, turn over to Commissioner Beverly and allow him to make whatever comments or ask whatever questions he would like. Um, again, Calvin, thank you for appearing before us today. I appreciate your comprehensive uh, comments. You know, I think of all the information you presented, I was most impressed with the discussion on community investments. Um, you know, through various regulatory proceedings that come before the commission, I'm typically aware of, you know, HEPCO's operational efforts in the region. However, we don't hear as much about the community investments. Uh, so the workforce development, the HBCU scholars program, and the racial equity fund are certainly worthy and impressive endeavors. Tyler, um, I appreciate your presentation on the vision or the vision that you have as a new CEO of Pepco Holdings. We're both new in our roles. And so, you know, I think it's very important to set out what your vision is. Um, I think it will be important that this vision continues to align with not only the district's clean energy goals, but the values of the district. When I talk about the values of the district, I'm really speaking to uh, what you said with regards to social equity and inclusion. Rodney, um, you know, Again, thank you for speaking more specific, specifically about PEPCO in the community. Uh, I'm glad to hear that PEPCO is, is out and participating in various community events. And I think it's very important that PEPCO continues to maintain that presence in the community. As Donna talked about, this is a company that's been serving the area for 125 years. And so it's, it's a company that the residents look to. And, and I think that that kind of involvement is very important. And then, uh, Donnie, you know, you talked about the 42% spent diverse spend in 2021. That was certainly impressive. Um, like you mentioned, we had supplier diversity here. And uh, it was clear that Pepco not only exceeded the MOU goal, but outperformed the other utilities. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear that Pepco is, is putting a lot of effort in this and that they are, you guys are making this a continued commitment. Um, and, you know, just as you stated, the commission will continue to focus on affordability, reliability, and resilience um, with focus on our clean energy goals. And so with that being said, I would like to give Commissioner Beverly a chance to make any comments or ask any questions that he may have. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to make an observation. I'm, I'm certainly pleased that PEPCO is doing well with its system-wide performance. And as you know, I've been an advocate of neighborhood reliability, and that's in reference to the, the notion that every every zip the code needs to be improvements, and that's not necessarily true if you just have improved system reliability. I've met with PEPCO uh, regularly in the past on this to get specific updates on particular communities, and although I haven't done it lately, I intend to do it in the future <laughs> and keep doing it. And I, I'm very pleased with the progress, uh, the public would not know this, that I meet with PEPCO regularly on this subject, and I can say that I'm very pleased with the progress PEPCO has made in its presentations to me, which have shown um, due diligence in this area in terms of making sure that everyone in all zip codes um, benefits from these improvements. Something else, I'd, you don't have to answer this right now, but if the situation on global fuel shortages, which is affecting everyone, presents challenges for the company and or financial challenges for our customers as those challenges for the company tend to be passed on to customers, I'd like to know about that uh, as those circumstances arise, even if we're talking about um, your estimations in terms of your future fuel costs. You may be protected for right now, but there may be uh, situations where that may not continue for as long as you thought. So again, I'd like to be aware of that. 
as those situations develop. But that's that's all my comment. I thought this was a great presentation, and thank you. So, uh, so Commissioner Beverly, this is Calvin Butler, and uh, to Chairman Thompson, thank you both for your comments. And I, I would like to take a moment to address you, Commissioner Beverly, to your last question and ask Tyler if you have anything to add coming in here. So to your direct question, the cost of natural gas, as you know, the commodity itself is a pass-through for our customers. We, we don't make a penny off of that. And serving uh, the District of Columbia, of course, being all electric, across our business, what we've found is that we have a solid hedging strategy and we're not seeing any very little of any impact across any of our utilities right now when it comes to those costs going up. And we're actually seeing the futures of natural gas go down over the next two years when we look at how it's planning out for us. So we see that commodity price actually going down. Now to another part of your question that you didn't go directly to, our supply costs. We are seeing supply costs go up across inflationary issues like any other uh, business. We're, but I want to assure you and uh, the chairman that we are managing those inflationary costs and those supply costs. One of the great things about being an organization of our scale, we work with our suppliers, we try to buy as bulk, and we try to manage that, we do manage that supply chain well into the future. And each of the leadership teams of our utilities are looking forward to saying, what, are, what does it take to meet our capital investments, maintain affordability for our customers, and minimize the impact on our customers going forward. And I think what the commission has done as an example in the multi-year rate plans allows for that transparency as we continue to build in. And it allows the utility to manage its business like a business instead of that annual reconciliation. We can actually sit back and manage it and see what's coming based on that partnership and collaboration with not only you, but other stakeholders. So to your direct question, the commodity is not an issue for us. I'll add a couple of things, Derek. Commissioner, Calvin, but at the end of the day, we're managing it. Go ahead, Tyler. I'm sorry. Okay, so just a couple of things to underscore what Calvin said. I'll, I'll take them, you know, you had a, some really good feedback, both of you guys, for us. Well, first around the, the pocket reliability. I think you're on a very good topic there, uh, Commissioner Beverly. You know, I do think, you know, we have had very good broad improvements that I we articulated on reliability. And I also think you pointed to, one of our focus areas, which is the pocket reliability, you know, those pockets in the, in, in the different communities. And are we aggressively going after, you know, those circuits that just seem to be problematic? So, you know, we have multiple programs around that. I appreciate you acknowledging that because when you look at those specific indicators, we've come, we've come a long way as well, but there's more work to do. You know, there's more work to do. So I want to acknowledge that. And we look forward to the ongoing partnership to go after those those pockets of performance and keep you updated. And we're open up, we're very open to your challenge and advice. And then, and then shift into some of the things Calvin underscored. We'll definitely keep you abreast of any global, you know, the global fuel shortages and what what the financial impacts of that are. You know, as part of our, our carbon reduction plan, we do have very aggressive plans to electrify our fleet over a very short period of time. Next time we're over to, to talk to the commission, we'll make sure we give you an update on that electrification. But nonetheless, we'll keep you updated on the on the fuel. And then last to, to kind of underscore the supply issues. I think Calvin characterized that well, that that um, very well. The big picture for us on supply is prices have gone up. What we've seen on delivery times on average for most of our major commodities, most delivery times have in fact doubled. And, and the one that we're seeing the most, you know, the most difficulty with, which we've talked to the commission about has to deal with our pad mount and our overhead transformers. And I could go through a litany of actions that were taken with, with different um, suppliers that we've, we've tried to get UL approval for and some of the different things we're doing around to mitigate that. But supply is a watch area. And then I'll, I'll comment on the, the pricing of the commodity. Definitely want to make sure we keep the commission abreast of that. Calvin characterized it appropriately where um, if you noticed in some utilities in the United States, they had some, I'll say, pretty drastic price increases of the commodity. One thing we work, we work, you know, we're, we're proud of here at Pepco Holdings and working with the commission is we do have three-year hedging strategies. 
so that when the price is going up, we're, we're kind of in a in in a situation where every year we have to kind of re up for a third of the generation of the district's demands, and that has allowed us to I'll say soften that impact. And then, as Calvin mentioned, our forward looking curves, it does it does you know we're hopeful that those forward looking curves for natural gas prices will come down and our customers will continue to not not feel that pain. But our hedging strategy has paid off significantly as we went through the last year and a half here of extremely high gas prices. So it's another area where Rodney and I'll talk offline with Morgan and we'll make sure we keep the commission well up to speed with what those forward price curves are looking like. I'll, I'll stop there and just say thank you. I don't have any other questions if you're waiting on me. <laughs> thank, okay. thank you for your presentation and your answers. Well, at this time, I don't have any questions either. So I would like to say thank you once again for the presentation today. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing from you um, not only next year, but in between time, uh, keeping yeah. us abreast of certain issues. And Mr. Chairman, just on behalf of Exelon, thank you and to Commissioner Beverly for just the partnership and collaborative nature in which you, you lead the commission. It, it truly is appreciated. And I hope you, as you've recognized the hard work that goes in, and I know we look forward to doing this again. And we, we know we'll take lead from Mr. Doy to include pictures of ourselves in our presentations to make it more uh, coming forward. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You take care.